Good evening. We begin lecture 33. The flow of today's lecture will be a, con a completion of our discussion on selection diversity. We conclude it by doing the mathematical characterization. Uh, antenna selection is one way of benefiting from multiple antennas. Uh, the, uh, the better or uh, more enhanced ways of uh, exploiting diversity would be to combine the signals. And in fact, we have made a statement without validation that the optimal combining should give us the sum of the uh, SNRs of each of the uh, different antenna signals. So today's lecture will validate or will prove that uh, result. So signal combining is the, opt or the way of uh, exploiting diversity in a better manner, better than selection diversity. And we will ask the question, what is the optimal combining that we can do? And in the diversity literature, the optimal combining is also known as maximal ratio combining. And then again, we will justify why it is optimal, why is it called maximal ratio, and then at the end of it, we will look at some uh, express, BR expressions, which will be uh, using the uh, mathematical characterizations. But first, we begin with a quick review of uh, lecture number 32. Uh, again, if there are any questions, uh, we'll uh, please do raise them. Uh, we'll assume that uh, uh, the 32 material is, is comfortable to everyone. So the basic framework is that uh, we have one transmit antenna, one transmit antenna, multiple receive antennas, and the signal that is transmitted by the transmit antenna is picked up by the different received receive antennas. So we've shown a case of two examples. Uh, the general case would be NR antennas. And uh, selection diversity basically says you just give weightage of one to one of the antennas and then zero to the others. And that's what this uh, signal represents. So selection diversity is really not selection, it's not combining, it's actually selecting the, between the different antennas. The uh, benefits of selection diversity we saw through uh, two independently feeding antennas and giving the benefit of choosing the better of the two in every situation. And we can see that definitely we will do better than either of the two antennas individually. And we showed that the, the cumulative distribution function can be expressed as a product of the individual CDFs. And in the case where all of them have identical statistics, it would be uh, raised to the power m. You sort of start to see the benefit of the diversity factor. We then went on to uh, look at the effect of a weak antenna and then uh, showed that if, if you have m antennas, m minus 1 strong and m and one of them weak, it's effectively like having m minus 1 antennas because the selection process will not pick up the weak antenna. It will always uh, favor the, the, the strong antenna. OK, now uh, just one very quick input regarding the benefit of selection diversity. The solid lines that we showed here are the cumulative distribution functions, which is what we have shown in the last graph, uh, raised to the different powers of m, and m being 1, 2, and 3. 1 is no diversity, 2 and 3 are selection diversity. And the solid lines are the CDF functions. I've drawn a dark blue line to indicate the minus 10 dB. So if your uh, fade margin was 10 dB, last time we discussed it as 20 dB, just as an illustration. So Basically, this normalized parameter, gamma by uppercase gamma, less than minus 10 dB, says that this is, the, uh, this is what it means. Uh, it's the same as saying what is the likelihood of the, uh, the CDF lying, being less than or in being in this range, in this range, uh, below 10 dB, 10 dB or less. And uh, th that is uh, denoted by the, uh, the, the, y, uh, the intercept on the y-axis. So for uh, the case of one antenna, it's, it's around 0.1 dB. Uh, sorry, 0.1 uh, is the probability. For two antennas, uh, it's about 8 into 10 power minus 3. For uh, three antennas, uh, it's not even uh, there. Basically, uh, it, it is uh, less than 10, 10 to the power of minus 3. It's something 10 power minus 4. So uh, you can see that uh, the benefits of the selection diversity already are quite substantial. When you go from 1 to 2, you can see there's a huge gain that you get. And then you start to see diminishing returns as you go to more number of antennas. And that's what we, maybe we can just mention that, the uh, principle of diminishing returns. As you increase uh, principle of diminishing returns, 
as m increases or as n r increases, yes, you do get benefit, but the, ben the, the increase in the performance uh, uh, becomes uh, less. We said that there are two types of uh, ways of exploiting selection diversity. You can select and then do the processing, or you process and then do the selection. And both of these are valid. There are uh, you know, trade-offs, which we have discussed in the last class. In the context of selection diversity, there are two special cases that we always want to keep uh, aware of. One is the uh, weak antenna. What happens? What is the context of the weak antenna? And the second one is what happens when there is a correlated antenna. And uh, again, there are uh, special scenarios where these antennas may still be of uh, value to us. Okay? And uh, we uh, ended the lecture uh, by saying that in a noise-limited environment, if you had a weak antenna, it would basically mean that the second antenna is not, select not selected you'll always be selecting the, uh, the one that is stronger. However, in the case of an interference limited scenario, uh, both the antennas are seeing approximately the same C over I. I thought that uh, it would be beneficial for us to revisit this result just so that we can start today's lecture. So um, the key point is that uh, selection diversity means picking the best of the antennas. Keep in mind that uh, in the context of a noise limited scenario, it is signal to noise ratio. In the context of an interference limited scenario, it will be signal to interference ratio. And uh, the fact that a signal is uh, an antenna strong or weak, we just want to make sure that uh, you're comfortable with that. So uh, a couple of points before we move into today's uh, lecture. So here are some points for maybe for you to uh, think about and note down. So what do we mean by a strong antenna? What, what is the notion of what is your understanding of a strong antenna? The strong actually refers to a high gain. So antenna A is stronger than antenna B is the same as saying the gain of antenna A is greater than gain. So basically this strong or strength that we are referring to is the gain of the antenna. And uh, when we have a weak antenna, so that means I have an antenna that does not have uh, much gain. What happens? It, uh, it has a limitation when it comes to the signal to noise ratio. We'll pick it up uh, a little bit later. But uh, basically, in the context of selection diversity, this antenna is not of much use. Selection diversity, this antenna will not be selected, basically. The weak antenna would be. But in the context of optimal, we will show that there is a benefit that even the weak antenna will have some utilization for our purposes. So uh, strong and weak both have same C over I. That means if I can ignore the noise, then the now um, the, uh, the the key point to uh, to keep in mind is that the notion of what is what is strong, what is weak, and uh, which scenario is uh, is is the one that we are we are talking about. Okay. Uh, before we uh, go into today's uh, lecture, I would like you to uh, think about a couple of questions. This is just to think about uh, diversity uh, in, in, its, in its entirety before we start focusing a little bit more. So ARQ, everyone familiar with that? What is ARQ? Automatic repeat request. Okay. Is that a form of diversity? Is that a form of diversity? The answer is yes, it is a form of time diversity, but it is not in the, it has some constraint. So if you have a transmitter and you have a receiver, okay, and so this is the, so the transmitter sends the packet, sends packet, does not, receiver did not get it, so NAC. So again, retransmit, retransmit, and this time the AC was received. Okay. Uh, again, this is the very very simplest form of uh, ARQ. Now, uh, notice that the information was sent two times. It was sent with some spacing in time, and hopefully that was more than the coherence time. And therefore, this is a valid form of diversity. It is uh, a form of diversity that requires feedback. OK, so it is a form of diversity that requires feedback. And again, that's a very powerful uh, set of uh, uh, 
scenarios when you have feedback going from the uh, receiver to the transmitter and uh, we will study more about these feedback channels so this is all, just keep in mind that you know there is uh, they were talking about a very uh, broad concept and this one is one of those second uh, question again very different in, in terms of nature um, what are the two things that we would look for in antenna diversity one is that it would have high gain Right? That would make it a strong antenna. That is number one. Second, that it is uncorrelated with other antennas. Because even if it had high gain, if it ended up being correlated with the other antennas, it was not of much benefit. Uncorrelated with the other antennas. Those are two things that you would want for diversity benefit. Now, what are the ways in which you can get uncorrelatedness? Uncorrelatedness, one of them is by spatial separation. That means distance. So spatial separation, you would need at least lambda by 2. Again, this is for lower wavelength. This is a little difficult for a handset. Of course, on a base station, you can do it uh, uh, reasonably well. If you cannot do spatial separation, what other ways do you get? You just say, no way I, no way I can get uh, diversity on a mobile. Is there any other way that you can get diversity? Anything that you're familiar with? Orientation. Louder? Polarization. Yes. Polarization is a way of getting. So you can have two antennas. One of them is vertically polarized, the other one is horizontally polarized, vertical and horizontal. Or you can have right circular polarization, left circular polarization. And there are theories to show that uh, your vertical polarization signal and the horizontal polarization signal are uncorrelated with each other. Similarly, the right circular and left circular, depending upon how you have transmitted your signal uh, and your environment, you could be using circularly polarized antennas. And uh, those would also give you uncorrelated. Uh. So again, something for you to think about in the broad context of, uh, of diversity. OK, uh, having uh, understood uh, this element, uh, I would now like to spend a few minutes on notation. And uh, in the last class, we, we wrote this down, but we probably went uh, a little bit fast. I just want to repeat that. So the metric that we are often looking at is c over n plus i. And uh, c over n plus i can, can be nicely written as divide numerator and denominator by c, it becomes i by c. Before you wonder why you did this, this becomes c by n inverse plus c by i inverse. OK? So this is, this is a nice way to visualize that. So uh, if we say that we are interference limited, interference limited, that means the noise power is much less than the interference power. Okay? So which means that uh, C over N is much larger than C over I, because I is much larger. This would also mean that C over N inverse is much less than C over I inverse. So that means the dominant term, this is the dominant term dominant term and therefore c over n plus i is approximately c over i. Okay? Of course, you could have said that uh, because n is much less than i, I'm going to ignore i. But uh, this is a nice way to visualize saying, okay, we always talk in terms of carrier to noise ratio. We don't talk about just, we don't measure the noise power or the interference power separately. So therefore, uh, this is a good way for us to uh, visualize that. So supposing I have two antennas two antennas. Now the, uh, 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 the signal on ant uh, with antennas ga gains G1 and G2. Now uh, what does G1, uh, what is what gets influenced by G1? What does G1 influence? It influences mod Z1 square. Right? What you transmitted was the same power. Right? There's nothing that doesn't affect. So what you eventually picked up was the channel coefficient. And if your gain was higher, that mod Z1 squared is going to be uh, a curve. So mod Z1 squared is proportional to G1. Mod Z2 squared is proportional to G2. OK? Now, carrier to noise, 
of antenna 1 can be given by mod z1 squared by sigma n squared into es okay whatever was your signal power what you transmitted uh, mod z1 squared is the gain because of the channel and uh, sigma n squared is the noise power again that is something that we do not have uh, any control over so similarly c over n for antenna 2 is mod z2 squared divided by sigma n squared es and now if i am told that uh, g1 is much stronger than g2 now you can see you know why uh, c over n1 uh, c over n for antenna 1 is going to be much larger than c over n for antenna 2 and and that's why antenna 1 will keep getting picked most of the time okay so this is the noise limited scenario and uh, again extend it to the interference limited scenario uh, the mod z1 squared is proportional to g1 now c over i for antenna 1 okay this is proportional to the 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 signal that is uh, from the desired signal and the interfering signal so basically the mod z1 squared affects the desired signal yes the interfering signal i1 mod z2 sorry mod z1 squared again affects that also okay so basically the ratio of the two is what removes the dependence on the gain and likewise you can see that for c over i uh, c over i for antenna 2 is also equal to es by i1 it should be the interfering signal power of the interfering signal so it's no i1 i2 so it is only i this is also going to be yes over i okay so uh, that is why even if g1 is much less stronger than g2 you may still have uh, some benefit in interference uh, in, in 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 the context of uh, addressing the interference issue yeah fundamentally the antenna should see different signals right why are we considering the powers to be the same uh, sorry i didn't get, didn't get the so antenna 1 and antenna 2 are supposed to see different signals so okay. how are we considering their powers to be the same okay good question the uh, question is uh, uh, what is the model underlying model let's let's clarify that so the r1 of t is z1 times uh, s of t plus some uh, interfering sig uh, interference coefficient uh, uh, let's call it as i1 i1 times i of t plus eta 1 of t right that is the inter uh, so uh, the second uh, signal r2 of t is z2 s of t <coughs> plus i2 that is a coefficient times i of t plus eta 2 of t okay now since we are talking about an interference limited scenario i am just going to ignore the noise for for the moment so now uh, the question that you are asking is it is the same signal that is transmitted what is different is how much of it ended up in my receiver and that is dependent on the gain that i will see and that in turn uh, will uh, will determine what z1 is and gain of antenna 2 will determine what z2 is so uh, and the same antenna is what is picking up the interference signal also so therefore how much of the interference i pick up also depends on the antenna gain so basically what we can say is z1 is proportional to mod z1 is proportional to square root of g1 it's it's uh, uh, one is the amplitude, other one is power. So the, so similarly, I one is also proportional to root G one. So when I take mod Z one squared by I one squared, the G one goes off, and likewise for G two. But your, the question what you have raised is actually valid because if you take C over N plus I. Okay, there is no scenario where you can completely omit the noise. If the gain is very weak the noise starts to become a dominant factor so even in such scenarios a weak antenna is slightly worse than the the, the stronger antenna so uh, it's not fair to say that you know it's exactly the same but uh, all the the important thing to note is that this this is this this factor is uh, something that we should not miss out because uh, the noise is not affected by the gain 
but both signal and interference are affected by the gain of the antenna and therefore uh, we have to take that into account in our uh, in our consideration okay very good any any other uh, any other questions okay if there aren't uh, we will spend a, a few minutes on the statistical characterization of the uh, uh, of the of selection diversity and uh, i believe you will find this uh, very interesting and also uh, a lot of intuition can be obtained from this uh, from this result okay and like before uh, in this uh, mathematical derivation there will I, i'll skip a few steps but i hope you will uh, fill it in and make sure that you are comfortable with the result we start with the uh, fundamental result of uh, selection diversity that is that the probability of a fade or probability or the cumulative distribution function is derived uh, is defined as gamma 1 gamma 2 gamma m i have m antennas all of them less than or equal to some threshold and assume we are going to make the assumption that there are m antennas and all of them are identical identical means they have equal statistics equal average snr which is denoted by gamma average snr is always denoted uppercase gamma so uh, this is a, a expression that we have already derived we'll just write it down 1 minus e power minus gamma threshold by gamma raised to the power m. This is the cumulative distribution function. We will call it as the CDF of gamma subscript SC that is for selection diversity and the, the value is gamma threshold. So, this is the expression that we have. Now, individual uh, SNRs are obtained or can be written down as gamma k's is equal to mod z k magnitude squared E s by n naught. Okay. So, basically uh, there is a uh, uh, signal to noise ratio uh, that is uh, when that would be the signal to noise ratio in the absence of any fading and because there is fading is present the instantaneous SNR is, um, mo mo uh, is modified is obtained as mod z k squared times E s by n naught. Now, from the uh, cumulative distribution function, uh, from this is equation 1, from 1, I would like to get the PDF. The PDF of gamma SC, instead of writing at gamma threshold, I just write it as gamma, which basically says I have to differentiate the CDF with respect to gamma. So, uh, please do that. It's just uh, uh, one step in the difference, process of differentiation. So, the exponent I get 1 m into 1 minus e power gamma divided by gamma raised to the power m minus 1. Then the second term which will be minus e power minus gamma by gamma into minus 1 by gamma. Okay. So, combine them you will get m by gamma e power minus gamma by gamma 1 minus e power gamma by gamma raised to the power m minus 1. So, actually we have obtained the PDF, uh, uh, the probability distribution function. Okay. Now, you may say what is the use of the PDF? Oh, wait a minute. One of the things that I would very much like to understand is what is the average SNR of selection diversity. So, one of the things that I would be very interested to know is e power gamma SC on average is selection diversity going to give me a benefit and how much of an advantage is it going to give me over the other antenna. So, the first thing uh, we would immediately like to calculate is expected value and expected value is integral 0 to infinity gamma f gamma sc of gamma d gamma right basically. Uh, so, you can substitute from equation 2 uh, into the expression that will give us 0 to infinity gamma m by gamma e power minus gamma by gamma 1 minus m minus 1 d gamma. Uh, one substitution and then we will be able to work with the result. The substitution that we would uh, we will use is let gamma by gamma be equal to y. 
I'm sure you can uh, do the substitution. You can please verify that this integral now becomes m gamma times 0 to infinity y e power minus y 1 minus e power minus y raised to the power m minus 1 dy. Okay, again, just it makes it a little simpler because we need to do some uh, algebra with this. Okay, so this is the general case and uh, one of the non-trivial cases is m equal to 3. So we will take m equal to 3 as a special case and see for insight because always is good to see uh, to get insight first. So if I substitute m equal to 3 in the previous equation, expected value of gamma SC3, okay, that 3 stands for 3 antennas, m equal to 3, is equal to 3 times gamma integral 0 to infinity y into that's a, there's a square term, 1 minus 2 e power minus y plus e power minus 2y into e power minus y dy. So basically you can uh, multiply out that uh, term and you will basically get uh, 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 integrand with three terms. Now there, as always, you're, all, you're perfectly at liberty to use standard results. A very convenient standard result is available to us. The standard result says integral 0 to infinity x e power minus mx dx is 1 by m squared. Okay. That will make life much easier because notice that each of the three terms are of this form. So the answer now is 3 times gamma 1 minus 2 by 2 squared plus 1 by 3 squared, okay. that is 3 gamma 1 minus 1 half plus 1 by 9, that is equal to gamma 1 plus 1 half plus 1 by 3. Now you may ask what is inside the bracket here can be interpreted in many ways, why did you interpret it like this? not for convenience because in the general case, the, the integral is actually much harder for us to do. But ba basically, you would have to uh, do a binomial expansion of the term with, the, with an exponent and then use the standard result. And the, uh, what you will get for the general case is expected value of gamma selection combining is equal to gamma times summation i equal to 1 over m 1 divided by i. Okay. So if it is 2 antennas, m equal to 2, it is gamma into 1 plus half. m equal to 3, its gamma is equal to 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third. m equal to 4, you can, you can expand. Okay. Very interesting result, very satisfying result which says that, uh, uh, yes, I do get a benefit, but the benefit is reducing as the number of antennas increases. But, uh, you know, uh, event, but it, it is made the assumption that the antennas are equally strong. If the antennas are not equally strong, you know, you're, uh, you can only, this is result is uh, applicable only in that, uh, in that context. Okay? So, uh, again, uh, the, once you have the standard result, I'm sure you will be able to do that. Uh, so let me just give you the, the task, okay. derive for the general case and uh, in Moodle we will give you the hints because uh, uh, I believe it is not straightforward even after trying the special case for m equal to 3, you will find that uh, there are certain substitutions that you will need. So derive for the general case, general case, okay. gamma SC for m antennas. But the important thing is to know the result and to, to un appreciate that it has certain, uh, certain benefits. Okay, we move on. So what have we said so far about selection diversity? Selection diversity is very easy to do. Pick the strong antenna and you will get a benefit in terms of overcoming the fades. It is definitely better than a single antenna. How much benefit you get, we were not sure, but we have now been able to quantify saying that the average SNR is actually going to be, if you have two antennas, it's going to be 1.5 times on average 
the antenna and uh, SNR of a single antenna. And if you have a third antenna and fourth antenna, you're going to see corresponding benefits. And I think this is a good enough understanding of the benefits of selection diversity. So now we move into the uh, the other, uh, the, the more uh, deeper uh, assessment of the uh, problem of di on, the, on the study of diversity. And of course, uh, students as always, uh, are, are curious, so the question uh, raised uh, or the question posed before us is what happens if I just added the two antennas? Why, why do you take so much of trouble finding out which is the better SNR and what if I added the two, would I not solve the, get the same benefit? Just add the two, R1 plus R2, what do you get? Z1 plus Z2, right? So you, if one is in a fade, the other one will pick you up. What's, what's your answer? Is that, is, that, is, that, is that question clear? The answer is I have R1, which is, uh, which is Z1 times S1, R2 is Z2 times S2. Just add the two signals, no problem, right? When if one is in a fade, the other one will come up. So you get a benefit. So uh, to answer that question and answer it in a correct manner, let's take a look at the, uh, the, the correct way of uh, addressing that particular problem. So it's actually a very interesting problem. It's a very important problem. So uh, we will make sure that we uh, address it uh, very carefully. Okay, so the uh, the question that we have before us is signal combining. Signal combining. That means you're going to do something to and and add or combine the two signals. Okay, in the, in the simplest form, you just add the two together. So the the framework same as before. I have one transmit to receive. The channel gain to antenna one is Z one to antenna 2 is Z2, this is the transmit side, this is the receive side. Okay, and uh, just so that we are complete, R1 of T, the received signal is Z1 times S of T plus eta 1 of T, R2 of T is Z2 times S of T plus eta 2 of T. What can you tell me about eta 1 and eta 2? Both are samples of AWGN which are uncorrelated because they are coming from two different antennas, experiencing two different uh, you know, uh, noise environments, but they're just sampling a random process with the same variance. Okay? So they are uncorrelated with each other, but they have the same variance. Okay. So now the qu question is, what if I did R of T is equal to R1 of T plus R2 of T? Looks like a good... good uh, uh, way to do it because the, what comes out is Z1 plus Z2 times S of T plus eta 1 of T plus eta 2 of T. Now that itself should give you a little bit of a warning signal. You added the noise terms. That means you have twice the noise. So you should have at least gained twice in the no signal to noise ratio. Otherwise, you actually have, you lose SNR. So uh, it's always, you have to be careful. So of course, we don't want to make a guess. So if I were to call this as a random variable z, okay? Now tell me the statistics of z. Expected value of z? Expected value of z is 0, okay? Now uh, if you have z1 and z2 Gaussian and you add them together, what do you get z as? Z is, al z is also Gaussian. So z is also Gaussian, okay? Okay, and we know that Z1 and Z2 are uh, independent of each other. So uh, if, if I was interested in expected value of mod Z1 plus Z2 whole squared, okay, so uh, uh, the, uh, the modulus squared, this would be expected value of mod Z1 squared same, uh, uh, plus expected value of mod Z2 squared expected value of mod Z2 squared, that would be 4 sigma squared. Each of them were 2 sigma squared, but now you got something with a slightly larger variance. Okay? Now, let's go back and answer it from a statistical viewpoint. You have a new channel coefficient, which is Z, which is 0 mean, and the real and imaginary parts are Gaussian. Forget the variance. What is its envelope? Really. Did you gain anything? No. The uh, level crossing rate, everything is going to be more or less the same. And now you say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I gained 
uh, maybe I gained something in the numerator, right? Because I did z1 plus z2. So uh, let's see if we actually gained something. So SNR1, if I had only one antenna, what would it have been? It would have been 2 sigma squared times ES signal divided by sigma n squared. Right? 2 sigma squared is the mod z1 squared, uh, expectorly of mod z1 squared. So, and SNR2 is 2 sigma squared by sigma n squared ES again. SNR of the combined signal nu is what? 4 sigma squared times ES, right? energy of the uh, transmitted signal. But you now have two noise terms. So you have to add 2 times sigma n squared in the denominator, which is the same as SNR1. On average, your SNR is also not any different. You didn't, you didn't gain anything by this process. So therefore, it's as good as waste of time. Okay? So your BER is not going to change. Uh, all of it is going to be uh, pretty much where you, where you were. Okay? So a uh, little bit disappointed, right? because we thought it was a good idea. But uh, you know, uh, let's see if there is a, uh, a better way and the answer turns out to be is that yes, there is a much, much better way and how do we, how, how do we work on that and uh, obtain the results that is associated with that. So here is a uh, way that we would like to do it. So uh, here is the proposed signal. We're going to call it co-phasing. And the answer and the reason for the name will become uh, apparent in a minute. So R of t is equal to e power minus phi 1 of uh, phi 1 times R 1 of t plus e power minus j phi 2 R 2 of t, where z 1 is equal to alpha 1 e power j phi 1 and z2 equal to alpha 2 e power minus j phi 2. Okay, those are the complex coefficients. So what did you do? You did a uh, counter rotation of the received signal. For the first uh, antenna, it, 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 the channel gave it a rotation of phi 1. You gave it minus phi 1 in the receiver. And if, uh, correspondingly, you do that. So basically, now if you write down the expression, what you get is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 they are already co-phased because alpha 1 and alpha 2 are real valued okay, into S of t. Yes, like before, I do have two noise terms, eta 1 of t e power minus j phi 1 plus eta 2 of t e power minus j phi 2. Okay. Very important observation. This is nothing but a phase rotation of the noise sample. The noise sample is a complex sample. You just did a phase rotation. So this is nothing but a phase rotation of the noise sample, right? So it, that means the power is not affected. Power in the noise is not affected. It just basically rotated it. If you take real squared plus magnet, uh, imaginary squared, you'll still get the same value. The power is not affected. You did not affect the noise. But you did something very advantageous to the signal. Okay? So let's see if we can assess what the uh, benefit that you have obtained is. So what is the average SNR? Average SNR says expected value of alpha 1 plus alpha 2 whole squared into ES divided by, I have two noise sources, so therefore I have to write 2 sigma n squared. Correct? So this can be written as expected value of alpha 1 squared plus alpha 2 squared plus 2 alpha 1 alpha 2 ES divided by 2 sigma n squared. Okay, couple of results that we already know. I just want to write it down so that it will be easy to uh, get to the final answer. Expected value of alpha 1 squared is? 2 sigma squared. Okay? This is the same as expected value of alpha 2 squared. Okay, what is the expected value of alpha 1? Do not say 0. What is that? Is equal to sigma root pi over 2. Okay? So please uh, substitute into this results 
So, you should get 2 sigma squared plus 2 sigma squared plus sigma squared pi divided by 2 sigma n squared. Okay? So, if you were to rewrite it, just a simple level of manipulation, uh, do not forget E s in the numerator. Okay? It should be 2 times sigma squared E s divided by sigma n squared. That would be the SNR of one antenna into 1 plus pi divided by 4, okay, which is approximately 1.79 times E s by n naught. Okay, whatever was, uh, if, you, if you call this as uh, E s by n naught. Okay. Okay, so the important thing to note is that uh, when I just added the two, I did not gain anything in terms of the SNR. But when I just did the phase rotation, it seems like I seem to have gotten a huge benefit. So almost 1.8 times the antenna uh, SNR of a single antenna. Okay, so cophasing is much much better than selection diversity. Cophasing. I will just write greater than, just stands for better. Uh, Cophasing SNR is greater than SNR of single antenna. Single antenna, it is also better than SNR of uh, selection diversity. Okay, we have just shown that uh, uh, selection diversity, uh, diversity m equal to 2. Okay. But what is the price that you had to pay for this? What is it that you have to do? You must know phi 1 very accurately because if you do not know phi 1, what will happen? You will, you will rotate. Uh, basically, what are you doing? You are taking the received signal 1, rotating it in a particular direction so that it does not have any, uh, the, the signal is along the real axis, right? Basically, you have taken out the complex rotation part. And likewise, you took the second uh, and uh, also you, so that is why they got uh, aligned on the real axis. But if you did not do that, they will still have some angle and then you will lose some of the, the benefit that you would get. Does it affect the noise? No. It is just another rotation. It does not matter. Noise does not get affected. But your signal gain will get affected. So uh, the accurate estimation of the, uh, of the, uh, of the phi's is going to make a, a very, very important difference. So, let us quickly write down what are some of the differences that you would see between the two of those selection versus selection versus uh, cophasing. Okay? Selection versus cophasing, this is easy to implement. Just have to pick one of the two antennas. You do not have to measure, uh, of course, you have to measure the SNR of the two antennas, but you do not have to get, get the ch complex channel gain. One thing that is a little difficult, it is it is difficult in fast fading, difficult in fast fading, because the antennas will keep switching with the one, the, with the one that is better, uh, fast fading. Okay, so, because the antennas will keep switching it, and it is hard to keep track of that. Okay? And how is it implemented? The uh, antenna selection typically is you, you measure, you measure, then you select, right? You, you have to pick the two and then you detect. Measure, select, detect. Okay? So obviously there has to be a time for you to measure. Even if you say that, you know, I'm going to, my, uh, my selection is going to be almost instantaneous. Okay? The minute I measure, I'm going to do that. But still, you have to do the measurement and you have to have a reliable measure of which one is a stronger antenna. So there is a time when you have not done measurement on either antenna 1 or antenna 2. You're still deciding. Okay? So, th and of course, after some period of time, you will do the, repeat the process again. You will do measure, select, and then detect again. So, the important point is this is not suitable for continuous transmission. If you have to con detect continuously, then when do you do the measurement? So not suitable, the selection diversity is not suitable if you have to detect continuously for continuous transmission reception. Okay? So uh, again, those are some. But on the other hand, co-phasing, it requires accurate estimate 
requires accurate estimate of e power j phi 1 and e power j phi 2. In other words, this is the same as saying z 1 and z 2. Okay. The, the way you would do it is you would estimate z 1 and z 2 and take the phase of that. The good news is that it is effective in all scenarios, effective in all scenarios. Even if you have continuous transmission, not a problem. You have to keep tracking it. You have to estimate it, but uh, effective in all scenarios. So, and of course, it has got slightly better uh, performance than selection diversity to begin with. So, this is a uh, good, good uh, uh, result for us to, uh, to keep in mind. Any questions on what we have said so far? Okay. So, as always, we ask the question. Yes, it is good that we know that we, some uh, uh, better than selection exists, co-phasing, but we want to know what is the optimal, what is the best that we can do uh, in, this, uh, in this environment. So, we will now address the question of optimal combining. And the result will come out to be, uh, uh, it will be such a uh, in intuitively uh, satisfying result that, uh, you know, the whole thing about diversity sort of starts to uh, really uh, uh, become fascinating. So, here is the, uh, uh, the, the problem statement. So, optimal combining. We have M antennas, M antennas, and I am allowed to apply a complex rotation to each of the antennas, as antenna signals. So, k equal to 1 through m g k. g k is not gain, it is a complex rotation. Uh, if if it is confusing with the, uh, with, the, with the gain term, please replace it with some uh, uh, c k or d k, something else which is uh, does not have any other uh, ambiguous uh, notation. I apologize if I did not think of the gain part, r k of t. Okay. So, g k is a complex number and you are allowed to choose it to be anything. Okay. The r k's are given to be r k of t is a single tap which means it is a non frequency selective fading or frequency flat fading channel z k times s of t plus eta k of t that is your received signal. The instantaneous SNR gamma k is given by mod z k squared E s by the noise in the nth antenna. Again, that depends on the gain of, or, uh, you know, depends on the uh, electronics. Uh, so, it could be that the antennas on the different antennas, on uh, the noise on the different antennas can be different. I mean, if it is connected to low noise electronics in its, uh, in its receiver, it could be different. So, this is the most general case. Normally, we would have said it is all the noise terms are the same, but in this case, we are even allowing provision for the noise uh, uh, power of the antenna to be different. So, if it is different, then it will be the instantaneous noise would be given by this. So, the problem statement is find the optimum set of GKs, the set of GKs where k equal to 1 through m such that the resultant SNR of the combined signal resultant SNR is maximized. So, I have to pose it, I have to pose it as a problem of estimating the SNR and then I have to apply the process of maximization and then show what is the choice of GKs that will achieve that maximum that we are interested in. And it turns out that it is actually uh, much, much simpler than what it sounds. So, let us write it down. It is just uh, a, a two step uh, answer, but let us just formulate it uh, carefully. So, the R of t, if I substitute the result, uh, the uh, expression k equal to 1 through m g k z k s of t plus g k eta k of t. Do not forget the g k on the noise term as well. Okay. By now, we have computed SNR enough number of times. So, I am going to trust you to help me compute the SNR for this expression. There is a signal part, there is a noise part. Okay. Help me. So, the signal part, if I take, it will be magnitude summation k equal to 1. It will be like a one comp, uh, complex coefficient representing that summation. k equal to 1 through m g k z k magnitude squared times E s that will be the signal component. 
Everyone okay with that? Basically, the, the complex gain that is multiplying the signal, you take the magnitude square of it. In this time, in this case, it happens to be that it's not one term, it's several terms that are adding together to give you that complex gain. Okay? Noise is e uh, easier for us to compute. You, there are uncorrelated sources, so therefore, you just have to take the variances of each of those. So the denominator will be summation k equal to 1 through m mod g k squared sigma n comma k whole square. I just want to make sure that everyone is comfortable with this. Basically, we have written down uh, uh, expression where uh, you think of it like this. Think of it as some z prime times s of t plus some uh, g k times eta k of t plus the, 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 the summation of the terms would be uh, g1 eta 1 of t plus g2 eta 2 of t plus gm eta m of t. Okay? So basically, I am taking mod z dash squared times es as my numerator and the variances of the denominator is uh, all the other terms. Okay? So basically, th th that is what is happening here. Okay. And uh, here again, some uh, uh, very useful results from vector algebra will help us in the, in the process. So we do not even have to do the differentiation. So we have a result known as the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Cauchy-Schwarz inequality it ha turns out to be very, very useful for us in this particular context. The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality says that if x and y are complex vectors, are complex valued vectors, then the following result is valid. Uh, the inner product of x dot y, inner product of two vectors means you take the transpose conjugate of one and then the other one. So basically inner product is a scalar value. So you take uh, x transpose conjugate times y and then you will get the inner product. So uh, the inner product is of the magnitude squared is less than or equal to the inner product of x times the inner product of y. Okay? So if you were to uh, rewrite this, this is basically saying x1 star y1 plus x2 star y2 plus dot dot dot, the number of vectors that you have the magnitude square of that is less than or equal to magnitude x1 squared plus magnitude x2 squared dot dot dot, magnitude y1 squared plus magnitude y2 squared dot dot dot. Okay? So basically, uh, this is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Now I would like to use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to the numerator. The numerator is summation k equal to 1 through m g k z k magnitude square. Notice that it looks very similar to the uh, expressions that, uh, that we have or the, very similar to the uh, uh, form that we are interested in. But I will do it with a slight uh, manipulation that will help us in the final result. So I'm going to multiply and divide by the same quantity. So it's not going to change the expression, but it will help us. Summation k equal to 1 through m g k sigma n comma k. I'm going to multiply by sigma n comma k. I'm going to divide z k by sigma n comma k. So actually, I did not do anything, but just redid this. And then magnitude squared. Okay. So this is the left-hand side of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So this is always less than or equal to the, uh, the, uh, the inner product of those vectors by themselves. So the inner product of the first vector, so for me the, the vector number 1 is corresponding to this one. This is vector 1, uh, this is vector 2, the uh, term corresponding to vector 1, summation k equal to 1 through m mod g k sigma n comma k magnitude squared, correct? The second uh, inner product 
I'm sorry to be summation. I'll just use a different variable for the summation. L is equal to 1 through m mod z l squared divided by sigma n k. Well, I need to take the modulus over the whole thing. Z, uh, z l by sigma n comma l magnitude whole square. May seem like maybe not very clear as to where we are even heading with the whole thing, but uh, probably just in one step we can explain. Uh, this term sigma is a real valued number, so I, I, I don't need to keep it inside the modulus. So this can be rewritten as summation k equal to 1 through m mod gk whole squared sigma n comma k whole squared. Am I right? The reason for doing it is? the same term is in the denominator. So that, that will cancel off the term in the denominator. And what is left on the second term, this is summation. I'll go back to the k as my variable. k is equal to 1 through m z k magnitude squared by sigma n comma k whole squared. OK? So my gamma MRC or gamma optimal, I won't even call it MRC yet, gamma optimal, which is, uh, which is what I'm trying to achieve or through this combination process is less than or equal to the signal power, the gain term on the numerator has cancelled the gain term on the denominator and what is left is summation k equal to 1 through m z, uh, z k magnitude squared divided by sigma n comma k whole squared. What is the definition of gamma k? Gamma k is mod z k whole squared E s divided by sigma n comma k whole squared. So by that, this, this right hand side is nothing but summation k equal to 1 through m gamma k. So the result is that if I try to do optimal combining by allowing each of the gain terms to be complex, the best that I can do is the sum of SNRs. And of course, if I can find a choice of GKs that will achieve uh, this uh, sum of SNRs, then so gamma opt is less than or equal to sum of SNRs is what we have shown. Now, uh, let me just uh, give you the following as a task for you to do, but it's uh, very important that you actually uh, try that. Suppose you choose the following, GK is equal to z k star divided by sigma n comma k whole squared. Okay? Even before we substitute and see, is it along the lines of co-phasing? Is this along the lines of co-phasing? Yes. Because why? Because when you have z k star, what will it do? It will rotate in the, in the correct direction. But here you are not taking only the phase, you are taking the complex gain also into account. And not only that, you, we seem to be taking the noise variance also into account. Okay? So again, we have to come back to justify what is it that we are doing. So if you substitute this in the uh, uh, expression, then what we, what you will, please, I would like you to verify is that the gamma optimal, gamma optimal, if you, but you'll have to go back and uh, uh, recompute the uh, expression. But uh, basically, what we'll find is the following. Gamma optimum is given by E s times summation k equal to 1 through m z k magnitude squared by sigma n comma k whole squared. Where does this mod zk come from? Because zk conjugate multiplied by zk. Okay? And then I have to add all of them, all the different ones together, and then square that to get the uh, gain of the signal component. Then 
I have also affected the noise component by these same GKs. So I have to take the, their variances into account. So basically, this would be summation k equal to 1 through m zk magnitude squared. I would get sigma power, uh, sigma nk power 4 in the denominator multiplied by sigma n squared, but you can simplify it to get sigma n comma k whole squared. Okay. Uh, you would have to uh, check it, but uh, please do do that. It is just one step of substituting this GKs in the earlier expression uh, to get the, so basically you have to substitute this in 1, where 1 is given by, 1 is given by this expression. Okay. So please uh, substitute GKs as given by that expression and verify that what happens now is the this term denominator will cancel one of the terms in the exponent. So what is what you get is E s times summation mod z k whole squared divided by sigma n comma k whole squared k is equal to 1 through m. This is equal to gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma m. Okay? So we have found a weighting term weighting uh, coefficients, set of coefficients that will achieve the upper bound for the optimal combining. So this is a form of optimal combining, optimal combining upper bound. It, it achieves the upper bound. Okay. So this is very, very useful result. This particular form of diversity combining optimal, it achieves the uh, SNR bound, it, that the uh, sum of the, uh, the resultant SNR, so this is equal to gamma MRC. And MRC stands for maximal ratio combining. It is the best form of diversity combining that we know, maximal ratio combining because it achieves the maximum uh, SNR benefit for us. And why is it called maximal ratio combining and what is the intuition behind it? First, notice that this is the cophasing part, cophasing. Okay? Now, supposing you had two antennas, supposing you had just two antennas and you did e power minus j phi 1 times r 1 of t plus e power minus j phi 2 r 2 of t. Supposing this is what you are doing in the cophasing. Okay. But I told you that SNR of antenna 1 is much, much larger than SNR of antenna 2. Okay. So what, what, would, what have you ended up doing? You have you, you have taken the, this one all had, had a low S, a noise to, component to begin with because it had only eta 1. What did you do? You took and added to it eta 2 which was much worse than it and you actually uh, could end up hurting the SNR of antenna 1 because of this scenario. Okay? So co-phasing like this when the two SNRs are very different is not a good idea. Obviously, that would not be the optimum way of combining. So what does the optimum combining tell you? That if the SNR or if the noise variance is very large on a particular antenna, you have to give it lower weightage. You can co-phase it, no problem, but you have to give it lower weightage. How do you do that? By dividing by sigma n squared. Because if your noise variance is large on a particular antenna, notice that GK will become small. So if sigma n comma k is large, GK will go down, which is the right thing to do. You do co-phasing, but you do weighted co-phasing. Okay? So that is why it is called maximal ratio combining. You, you combine it with a certain ratio, and that ratio is dependent on the SNRs, or it depends on the noise variances. Okay? So last question to close today's lecture. For co-phasing, I needed to compute the phases. What do I need to do for maximal ratio combining. I need to do channel estimation, which means Z1 and Z alpha 1, e power j phi 1, alpha 2, that is all. I need to estimate the noise variances. Okay, So that is a non-trivial task. But if you are willing to put in the effort to uh, do the noise variances, then you will get the optimal combining. 
or you can make the assumption saying well all the noise variances are the same in which case what should you have done in the co-phasing what could you have done in the co-phasing you could have done z1 star r1 of t plus z2 star r2 of t is that correct that would have been the that is that is pretty much the uh, because you have assumed sigma n 1 and sigma n 2 are the same. So, basically ok. So, then that comes comes brings me to my last figure for today. It is if I cannot do diversity in the receiver I do something called transmit diversity. Transmit diversity and I will I'll stop with this. So, the transmit diversity scheme says I will now put the diversity component at the transmit side ok. So, now uh, we have to be a little bit careful so that uh, we, we make the so obviously there is a channel gain from here this is z 1 let me call this as z 2, but in order to be a fair comparison I have to transmit the same total power that means I must transmit power p by 2 from here p by 2 from here and the way to do that p by 2 is to make sure that I do 1 by root 2 here 1 by root 2 here correct that is only only then it is a fair comparison because this, this should be the same as what did I do uh, in the case. So, I have divided my power into p by 2 p by 2 I am transmitting from these two antennas. So, what will I get at the receiver r of t will be z 1 plus z 2 times s of t right. How many noise terms? How many noise terms? One noise term because there is only one antenna at the receiver right. Now, you may say well you know what actually I have done better than uh, uh, you know uh, diversity combining at the receiver no wait a minute wait a minute. Uh, there is a 1 by 1 by root 2 sitting in the front which will scale your uh, the advantage that you got by having only one noise term uh, actually went away. But more importantly what did you do you did z 1 plus z 2 which is going to give you no advantage at all. So, what should you have done? So, what we should have done is 1 by 2 z 1 star 1 by 2 z 2 star and then transmitted it then you would get optimal combining at the receiver uh, and uh, this this would be a, a very good mechanism except that you need a feedback channel which tells the transmitter what z 1 and z 2 are ok. So, if you have feedback from receiver to the transmitter then you can actually move the diversity part onto the transmit side and get some additional benefit or basically get the same benefit. So, if you say that my receiver is uh, you know, low complexity very uh, simple receiver can you do something at the base station side yes provided you give me feedback ok. Think about it we will build on this in the next lecture thank you. Mm -hmm.